Today on the Play It Brave podcast, I have the most angelic, I mean, she truly looks like a Disney princess. And come to think of it, her husband looks like a Disney prince. They are Disney royalty. I have Lauren Fair on the Play It Brave podcast today to talk about all things destination weddings, all things whimsical, joyful, and how she delivers a powerful experience to her clients. Not only was Lauren named one of the most influential and inspiring people in the wedding industry by The Knot, but she was also named by Brides, one of the 75 best wedding photographers in the world. She travels around the globe and her images are truly one of a kind. I am so excited to have Lauren on the podcast today. And I've met Lauren in person a few times at the Hybrid Collective. Every time she is so full of light, so full of talent, so full of joy. She truly does walk the walk and talk the talk of someone who is working hard, making sure they deliver epic images and truly making her dreams come true. And that's what we're all about here at the Play It Brave podcast. So let's dive into my interview with Lauren Fair. You're listening to the Play It Brave podcast. Join Darcy for a wild rummage around in her wit and wisdom. She's a photographer, an educator, and a marketing ninja. Each week, she's going to be teaching you all about creating a life full of mindset, money, and marketing miracles. Listen to real-world experiences and surefire strategies from expert guests, all to keep you focused on your path to success. Think less hand-holding or fist bumps. So stop playing safe. It's time to start playing it brave. Here's your host, Darcy Benincosa. Lauren, welcome to the Play It Brave podcast. I'm so excited to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for having me, Darcy. This is amazing. And, you know, it's a first to be on video too, so that's fun. (laughs) You know, people want to see your face. They want to see your beautiful hair. They want to see this gorgeous office. I I did say in your intro that you are a Disney princess. (laughs) Oh, goodness. Well, I don't know about that. (laughs) But you just like are this beautiful, kind loving, everything that I think you try to bring out in your wedding photos, you exemplify. And to me, that's a huge example of what we put out there. We get back into the world. And I just feel like you and Tim have found this way of, of having your dreams become reality. Oh, that's so sweet and so kind. That's the nicest introduction I've ever heard about myself. Thank you. <laughs> so tell us a little of how you got here. Did you, how, how long have you been doing wedding photography? I mean, you have so many accolades. You've been published in everything. You've been named on the top list of everything. No, oh, you're so sweet. <laughs> so you're always booked out. You're all, you know, you've always got this flow happening. You've got this dream business. Can you sort of, this is a really big question, but can you yeah. kind of pinpoint little steps along the way where you felt like you were being pointed that this was what you were meant to do. Yeah. I mean, that definitely is such a good description of what I hope our life is and what the goal has always been. And so that's super kind of you to recognize that. And that makes me feel so good. And, you know, I could say the same back at you, by the way, before I talk about myself, Darcy, you are literally killing it, and I love everything about your business. This so. podcast is not about me. Stop right now. <laughs> <laughs> I just it's very gracious before saying that about you because I respect you so much, and um, I feel the same things about your business. So, for us, we have been working together. We started shooting back in 2010 mm-hmm. professionally, and I mm-hmm. use the in quotes because we were advertising on Craigslist and Facebook ads and all those really high quality lead sources that we all know about, right? <laughs> Not at <laughs> I've all. I've never tried Craigslist before. Oh, yeah. That's where I always thought like oh, yeah. mingles go to mingle or something back in back in 2010. Man, I know. It was it was a creepy place. Um, believe it or not, we booked one or two weddings. I was a 19-year-old kid when I started. So I didn't know anything. I mean, I was trying Yelp. I was trying, you try everything when you first start your business. And this was almost pre-social media. I had an Instagram, but blogs were actually just becoming really popular. So for me, I just fell in love with photography. I went to Italy for the first time in 2009 to visit my sister who was studying abroad in Florence. And if you've ever been to Florence or anywhere in Europe, especially France or Italy, 
everyone on the street really likes to just make out with each other and they're very they expressive, do. right? And every, every corner is just full of beautiful people in stylish clothes making out on corners. <laughs> and I just <laughs> fell in love with shooting people. I bought my first DSLR before that trip. And I just would sit on steps, on church steps, and I remember seeing light for the first time, and it revolutionized my world. Mm-hmm. I looked down an alley, and I saw backlighting for the first mm-hmm. time, and I saw that glorious halo, and I, I pressed the shutter, and that single moment set me on a trajectory for the rest of my life. I was 17 years old. I had no idea what I was doing with my life, but I've always been extremely driven. Um, I went to school. I double majored in organizational communications and international business, not photography at all. So you were in Europe watching everybody make out, and that's when you knew your life's calling was to photograph people making out. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> that's your Minus calling the card. making out, because I don't really love photos of kissing, but I just saw that interaction and that love and I wanted to document it. I wanted to freeze it. And I also fell in love with light and architecture at the same time, I think, right. um, which has very much inspired my work too. Yeah, it really has. I was going over your portfolio today and there's so many just beautiful structures. I feel like you have really mastered consistency in your lighting Thank so you. that your portfolio looks so, like I can look at it and I know you took it. And I feel like that's the key to a major portfolio is when people can see your image before seeing your name and know it's your image. A signature look. Absolutely. How did you develop your signature look? Yeah. So when I was that 17 year old kid, bought that DSLR, I went to school, I double majored in organizational communications and international business, no formal training whatsoever on photography. It just fit. It was just something that I innately knew how to do And I didn't have to struggle necessarily as far as seeing that light and seeing emotion and seeing the interaction between people. So once I graduated college, I launched my business right away. I shot 30 weddings my first year in business. I got married. Oh, congratulations. That's huge. Yeah. So this was 2010. (laughs) Was it referrals? How did that happen? It was a mixture of everything. It was, you know, I had been building up my blog with college friends. I just asked all of any couple I knew, I just asked if I could shoot them when I was in college. Mm -hmm. And so I started getting a little bit of those referrals. And then I also used wedding wire and the knot. I used everything, every source possible because I was so hungry to make this work. I had no fallback plan. I didn't have another job lined up. I wanted this to work and I wanted it to be good and I wanted it to to have that excellent quality to it. I was terrible and my editing was terrible, but I knew what I wanted to be. I knew I had that aspirational journey and that innate I that was buried in there beneath Mm -hmm. all of the learning and all of the process that goes through when you're just kind of figuring things out and figuring out your editing style. And then I started shooting weddings and that was that first year was crazy. I mean, I was so overwhelmed. I shot 30 weddings. I had no idea what I was doing as far as, you know, backend systems and all of that to handle that type of workload right away as a 21 year old at that point. Um, that was a big year of growth for us. And so my husband, Tim, we also got married that year. I was a child bride. We got married very young. (laughs) Were you 21? Oh, 20. I was like, dang, 17. (laughs) I don't know. I live in the state of child brides, Utah. So 21 sounds like when all my friends got married. So (laughs) that's ancient. I'm basically an old maid. So uh, we got married at 21 and he was 23. And he actually sold his business and joined me full time within that first year. And we just went at it hard. So we. Can I ask one clarifying question? Don't lose this thought. But so many people do the knot or they do Mm -hmm. wedding wire or they do this and they're afraid to invest in all of them. Was it really expensive to invest in all of those? Was it not that expensive at the time? Because back then you could just get one. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm pretty. And then you'd book 12 weddings. Remember those days? <laughs> I do remember those days. Those were the days. I still I remember my first style me pretty feature. It was in 2012. Um, yeah, no one knew who I was. So I had to get my name out there. Mm-hmm. And I think because I went to school for business, I, 
I, I call myself a businesswoman who happens to be a creative, right. not the other way around. Business comes very naturally to me. me and too. I knew I just had to have that market saturation. I just had to get my name out there. So I tried everything. And yes, it was kind of expensive. And that's kind of what I was mentioning when I had no fallback plan. I, got it. I put everything out there and I wanted to invest. I got like the top spot in all the sites and I just put my work out there. Um, so yeah, it was. It was an investment. For sure. And I only did that for maybe two years. But I think it's brilliant. I think it's brilliant. I think so often people are afraid of massive growth because problems do come along with it. But Mm -hmm. you grew massively because you did a massive marketing plan. That's kind of what I did too. And when people are like, I need to grow, but I don't know what to do. And I just want to say, like, do everything. Do everything. Because <laughs> do you, everything. you never know where the right referral is going to find you. And certainly we had some, you know, weddings come along that were not our ideal clientele, of course. I mean, when you're putting a, a wide net out there like totally. that, you're going to get a lot of inquiries that are not necessarily what you want to keep shooting. But what we did is we challenged ourselves to shoot five images per wedding that we would consider in our style and in our brand. And that shaped our portfolio. And I never blogged or showed anything except those five images from each wedding or each shoot, as long as they were within our brand and within our voice that we wanted to be shooting. That's what we showed. That's what we marketed. And so with 30 weddings, that actually built fairly quickly. Um, that's within that first year. Did you guys sit down and have a discussion? What will these photos look like? Yes, we did. I did that with myself too. I'm like, mm-hmm. these five images, I'm going to take at every wedding. Yeah. I'm going to develop a style. I'm exactly. going to be recognizable. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you guys decide that? Did you take a branding course? Did you already know that you needed to form the strong brand? Yeah, I think so. Tim is also a, a business person. He um, actually launched his own business very young, sold it at that point when he was 24. And when he joined me full time, he actually did landscape architecture and hardscaping. Mm -hmm. And so he sold that business to join me. So we're both business people. And I think the, the one thing we had going for us is that we had no fear of failure, which is, I think something that holds a lot of people back. When I talk to photographers, they say, what if I invest $2,000 in marketing or I take a course that's really expensive and, you know, I'm sure it'll help me, but I'm scared to invest that. And I think we were just young, dumb kids and we didn't know any better to be afraid of all of those potential failures as an adult business owner, you know, we just, we just went for it. And I think that that really helped us, but we pulled an all nighter one night where we just laid out a full business plan. We wrote down words that inspired us. We wrote down words that we wanted our work to, to be like, and we just built off of that. And the next kind of jumping forward a little bit, the next part that really transformed our business was, uh, in end of 2012, beginning of 2013, I bought a contacts and I started shooting mm. film. The contacts changes everything. The Changed love story with the contacts. Everything. Yeah. The love hate relationship sometimes, but totally. mostly I've owned many and sold a, a few that were complete, <laughs> complete duds. <laughs> duds. Yep. It's the craziest camera. Yeah, it is. But, uh, but I found film and that was the catalyst that took our brand from a successful young growing business into more of that luxury clientele. Mm. And we found our style, we found our voice, we found the editing, we found everything. So 2013, 2014 were our years of defining who we were. And then it was just massive, massive growth um, from that point forward. So So are you a hybrid photographer now? I assume you are. I am. Sure. I think yeah. everybody is, right? Yeah, I, don't, I think I, so. Yeah. <laughs> John Camless isn't. I know he, he doesn't even own a digital camera, but yeah, most of us do that. Do you have your own presets or how do you how do you match your voice? Yeah, I do. So for portraits, I'm 100% film. For engagement sessions, I'm 100% film. For editorials, anything like that is going to be all film. I do have Me my too. own presets, um, Lauren for presets. And those are mostly for you know, we don't shoot all the family formals on film. We don't shoot totally. like every single bridesmaid coming down the aisle. If there's 16 of them on film, I think that's <laughs> a little bit of a waste of money. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, especially if you get really good at editing and can match those things. Um, but yeah, and of course, darker receptions, you know, we shoot all the details and key moments on film as well. But then of course, party dancing, all of those things. So yeah, we, we've just learned to be really good with editing and 
matching that. We also have a team. We have a big team who helps. Yes. And yeah. As I, you know, I finally, you cannot do yeah, it alone. Last year, I, I've got my kick-ass editor and she does yes. all the mm-hmm. digital matching and she's a genius and we've worked really hard to get the formula right. Exactly. And she takes the extra time to do it. Whereas I don't know if I sent it to just a company, they would, mm-hmm. so she, you know, and I'll pay her for her extra time. Like, but she's, I couldn't run the business without her right now. So a hundred percent. I couldn't yeah. either. We have yeah. two editors and I can't imagine. I literally cannot imagine our life without them. <laughs> I know. I, I told her like, Oh, I don't need you for this one session. And I had to edit it this week. I'm yes. like, Oh my gosh, this takes way like, too much why? of my time. How did yes. I used to do this? I was reminiscing I with my friend. I said, I used to do all of this myself for mm-hmm. like eight years. I would edit yeah. every single thing. Wow. The time, like, how did I do that? So I know. And think about all of the things that you fill your time with now that push your business forward. Exactly. Editing is just a maintenance thing. And I think that learning what pushes your business forward and is the best use of your strengths as compared to, you know, kind of some of those time sucks that are repetitive, but still important that you can outsource. You can train a trusted person. Exactly. To do. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. Game changer for sure. Yeah. So when I was looking over your website and you you're talking about building this brand with Tim, you had three words. Now, if, are these the right words? Exquisite, joy-filled, iconic, or so, those some of the words you came up with? Those are the words. Yes. I love them. The explain, words. explain. I love exquisite because your work truly is. It's no. truly joy-filled. Iconic is perfect. Um, did you guys toss around a lot of words? Did these come pretty easily? Yeah, we did toss around a lot of words. I think that, and these are kind of newer words. These are like two-year-old words. So mm-hmm. it's evolved. And I think that that's totally. okay. Because I'm pretty sure we started with like beautiful, loving, like the most generic words. Right. You know, <laughs> like we take beautiful wedding Romantic. <laughs> Mine was Romantic. Rom- Mine was like romance, epic. Yes. Yes, exactly. Like, yeah. These are a lot more specific. Whenever I see beautiful as a brand word, I'm like, no, like no. it just can't even exist yeah. there because it's too boring and it's too generic. Exactly what you said. Exactly. So I love exquisite, joyful, yes. iconic. Yeah. So what those three words mean to me at least. So exquisite is basically a more elegant word for beautiful. But of course the word exquisite, I think brings to mind someone with impeccable taste. It it brings to mind someone who, you know, someone or something that is just breathtakingly beautiful. It's beyond just a common sort of beauty. It's the type of beauty that makes you stop in your tracks. And so that's the type of images we want to create. And that's the type of places we want to photograph in. And so that's why the word exquisite is our first one. Joy-filled is really important to me. I think that, you know, and Darcy, I love how you have such a cool style where, you know, you just like these like asymmetrical crops and you have these like really cool, like negative space and I'm obsessed with it. I love what you do. And I think it's so recognizable. And one thing for me, when I was looking at, you know, what words I want to define us is that I was always very drawn to images with joy. and you know, not just happiness, but like, like joy. And the word joy, I think for me can be a quieter word than necessarily like laughter or happiness. Mm -hmm. I think that joy shines out through your eyes Mm -hmm. and it's just a word that I resonate with. And so even if it's a serious quote unquote photo, I think that it can still have joy. Um, so that I put a lot of thought into that one too. But well, again, I think it really is who you are. And yeah. I feel like as artists, sometimes getting to know your art is getting to know yourself. Yes. And if you can kind of tap in to what you are and what you want to represent, like mm-hmm. I have, I like sexy, sexy photos. Yeah. I yes. can get a couple <laughs> to break through their barriers and get a little bit more sexy. Yeah. That's really fun for me. And I remember working with my sister and she's all about the joy and the laughter. And she was like, you need to just bring more happiness into your photos. Like I, I, everything's this or this. And I thought, you know, I get it. Like I've tried to do that a little bit more, but it's so much about what feeds our soul a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I do see that with your images, very 
joyful. And I feel like you bring a lot of joy to the wedding day. I think you bring a present. Some photographers are really quiet. Yeah. Some are, you know, I've heard stories of some who just stand back and just right. document things, but I, mm-hmm. I have a feeling you probably guide them through a joyful space. I think you Experience, hold a lot of yeah. happiness and space for them and, and are really yeah. a good presence for them on the day. So I'm sure that brings you in so many referrals. So tip number yeah. one for everybody listening, you have to develop <laughs> a really good, a good personality. <laughs> That's so true. So yeah. True. <laughs> Very true. And I love that you said that Darcy about what you're drawn to, because I feel like Interestingly enough, I've been drawn lately to the kind of like sexy, intimate shots too, Mm. but I feel like the word joy still fits Mm. in that brand. So some of these like just really like close up intimate, you know, shots that are a little bit on the sexy side, I'm obsessed with them in my own work too lately, but I think they still have joy and it's not, and that's why I said, it's not just happiness, like over the top laughter. It's, it's that presence of being content almost and having that joy. Um, so that's so interesting that you said you're bringing a little more joy and I am resonating lately with a little bit more of that like intimate kind of sultry. Look. Yeah. Sultry so, is a good word. Yeah. Sultry. I think, yes. I think <laughs> the way couples are showing their love is also changing. It's yeah, very different it's than open. when we started 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And I feel like couples are taking more risks they yes. want to show their love in bigger ways. They kind of want to feel a little bit more like they're in a magazine or on a reality yes. show. I mean, that sounds weird, but the traditional old school wedding photos are really changing because yes. people are changing. Technology is changing. All of that affects how we get to capture mm-hmm. capture it. But your last word is iconic. Mm-hmm. And I think there is something like I love iconic. I just launched two shoots for my Paris workshop and it's the iconic woman and the iconic man, because there is something just yes. iconic about the male form and the female form. So explain what was behind your reasoning behind that. Yeah. And I loved your mood boards that you were sharing oh, about that Paris yeah. workshop. Those Beyonce vibes were real good. Right. Oh, um, I just got to find the hat and the outfit. I need to models. Find, yes. find Beyonce stylists. I think we found exactly. the models. They're going to be Ooh. pretty badass. Yeah. Perfect. Oh, yeah. Sounds amazing. Um, yeah. I love the word iconic and Paris is such a good place to be iconic in. I mean, right. Mm. Is it is. Perfection. It's one of those cities. Yes. Um, and the word iconic for me, I talk a lot in my workshops and teaching about um, creating the hero shot where you encapsulate everything about a wedding day into one frame or Mm -hmm. each part of the day into one frame, right? And I think the word iconic for me, it exemplifies strength and something that is a definition of a culture. And so, you know, we specialize in destination weddings, which I know you do as well. You shoot Mm -hmm. so many destination weddings. And, you know, the reason that we've been able to stay consistent when shooting in different countries, different regions, different cities, different venues, indoor, outdoor, all over the world is because I think we seek to create these iconic shots that bring in architecture. They bring in, you know, whatever like the main floral installation of the day is. They, you know, show off the fashion. It's just kind of this this moment in time, almost like a time capsule of like this was 2018's defining style of Mm -hmm. weddings and that everyone could aspire to be this level of iconic within your wedding. Um, So I love that word. I'm obsessed with the idea of, you know, icons and why they're icons. And Me too. Yeah. And it's just such a cool word. And so, you know, that's something that I strive to create in our work is an iconic image, something that and, I, and that's another reason why I love film because I feel like film is iconic in and of Me itself, too. right? Me too. It's just always going to be classic. Yes. You're never going to look back on it and think, what were these colors? What was yes. happening? Why do yes. I look orange? <laughs> like Exactly. Just, yes. <laughs> that's what you, I can appreciate moody photography. There have been times when I've been drawn to it. I did a Japan workshop and the light was so barely there because we did it in December and... And that like was beautiful, but I come back again and again to film and the Mm -hmm. color that I get with film and it just nothing. Weddings I shot 10 years ago and probably you too, I still use images from them in my portfolio because the look of my photos hasn't hasn't changed. Maybe my clients have gotten more, Mm -hmm. you know, grander or I I book more per wedding, but that color that, yeah, you're right. It's iconic. 
It is. Yeah. And I think the, the locations that we choose to photograph in can lend themselves to that as well. So, you know, we don't shoot a lot of, you know, kind of like standard, I call them wedding factories where it's just tons of purple uplighting and just like, kind of like this crazy feeling to it. We don't shoot venues like that because I think that they will be out of style within five years. I don't think that, you know, I think that you can create super classic images anywhere, but, you know, something that is classic and iconic and will never go out of style, that's the type of weddings that I resonate with. And so that's the type of weddings that we want to be a part of because we connect. And there's so many weddings happening in the world that every couple should have a photographer who is super excited and connects with exactly their vibe and their style. You know, I don't think that you have to be a one size fits all photographer. I don't think that you should have to be. I don't think you should be. I I don't think you should be. Yeah. It's going to really make it hard for people to find you. Exactly. So you've been an educator for a long time Mm -hmm. and people seek you out for all sorts of knowledge because you are very knowledgeable and you have grown your business and you grew it very quickly. Um, What are some of the big things that you teach? Mm -hmm creatives who are like, Lauren, I just want to be you. (laughs) You Oh my goodness. (laughs) When they're like, how do I have your business? What, what do I do? So after you guys grew big that year, what have been some of this consistent practices you put into place to make sure your business thrives? Definitely. Yeah. Um, I guess that's kind of two parts, but as far as what we teach, um, Oh man, it's a lot. It's a lot of content. If you come to one of our summarize it, people need to go to your workshop. So don't tell us everything. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Come to a workshop. We have to pimp your workshop out too, because I know you're going to Italy. And hearing you speak, I'm. I keep thinking, should I? I Do I haven't attended a photography workshop in years, but I want to go to this. I want to see these iconic Italian locations and everything. Come guest speak. Come, come and guest speak. Um, I will. That but sounds amazing. I, seriously, is this well, happening? Just, okay. <laughs> yes. Yes, I think it is. Let's talk dates after after we finish sounds recording. Good. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So everybody come to me and Darcy. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, we do have one spot still open for our Italy workshop this summer. Paris is sold out, but um, we do have one spot. So if you are listening and you want to make 2020 your year where you just deep dive into your business. We'd love to have you. Um, I'm pretty sure it will be but, sold out by the time this podcast airs. Oh, everybody, you're so sweet. <laughs> we, need to, we need to get on her waiting list and ask her to, so you know, funny. we need to ask you to do one more. <laughs> um, so as far as the pr- business practices that we really implement. So um, after that year, 2013, 2014 was kind of our years of defining who we were, who we wanted to work with, the type of weddings we wanted to shoot. We were developing our destination business. And so I think that consistency, not creativity, has gotten us to where we are. Mm. And I think that sometimes we as creatives can get caught up so much in the technical of like, oh, what camera should I buy next? Or what film stock are you shooting? And those are important questions. But I think the most important question is, who do you want to be and where do you want to be? in five years, in 10 years, what do you want your business to look like? And do small things every day to get you to that point. So, you know, I knew that I wanted our brand to be this top luxury photography business that we were working with our dream clientele and shooting in beautiful, historic, iconic locations all over Mm -hmm. the world, like the estates and the villas and those type of um, venues that we love connecting with. And so I dove in head first. I planned and designed and shot so many styled shoots because no one's going to hire you for an iconic location if they don't see you shooting in iconic locations. Absolutely. But it's almost the chicken before the egg where you have to create the content and you have to create that amazing viral content that makes people save it on Instagram and hit that little flag where it's being saved and, you know, it's part of people's inspiration boards. That's how you grow your brand really quickly is you create content that people pay attention to. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not getting that with your current wedding clientele, let's say you're shooting a ton of barn weddings and maybe you don't want to be shooting as many barn weddings anymore, or you want to diversify your portfolio. Um, You know, let's say you're not shooting enough diversity, even in ethnicity, and you want to be breaking into a different market. Let's say you want to shoot more Indian weddings because they're fabulous. Um, You have to create that content to appeal to those people or else they're not going to be able to see themselves in your work and in your portfolio. So that is one thing that we really tried to do and that I still to this day do. I shoot tons of editorials um, every year because 
they are something that I think pushes our brand forward and, you know, our brides love fashion. And so they're something that brides can connect with and aspire to and, you know, be inspired by um, as well. So I think planning a lot of editorial shoots early on in the style that we wanted to at least go towards, that we weren't there yet. Um, that was a huge, huge thing for us as far as pushing our business in the direction of the brand we wanted to go. Yeah. I remember doing that too. I thought yeah. I need to just create yes. a fake wedding <laughs> that is exactly what I want to shoot Absolutely. and really curate my portfolio because I think sometimes people feel like they don't have enough images. Right. So then they just keep putting out every image that they shoot. Exactly. Really like image, like portfolio curation to me is one of the number one things people can do to book the destination weddings. It's the big thing that made a difference for me for what, when I started booking all over the world. Absolutely. And I think you have to emotionally remove yourself from the images. You do. Because I think we as creatives are very connected to our work. And so we think that every single image from a thousand image wedding was awesome, but it's not. Some of those are just memories for a couple and they shouldn't be your marketing images. Yeah. And I love how you did the five images because I did really short blog posts to begin to. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I go to these places and they're putting a hundred images in a blog post to show the entire wedding. And I just don't think people blog like that anymore or that's That's just not the way I think to book what you want. Um, How did you learn how to curate your portfolio? Do you feel like, I feel innately that I'm really good at it and that Mm -hmm. I can be really ruthless and that I can really put my emotions aside. So I'm not emotionally attached to a lot of images. I feel Uh like I can see it and it's, I give emotion, I I, I give portfolio reviews to a lot of other people and can Mm -hmm. say, no, no, yes, no. It's like how I'm on Tinder. No, no, no. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Swipe right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree with you. I think that innately I know exactly what I want to put out there, but that's been a developed thing. You know, I definitely didn't have that cutthroat of a opinion of my own work 10 years ago. I think that's yeah, been- Yeah, me either. Yeah. I was photographing that. people in front of brick walls. Like, let's face it. Tons of brick walls. Bad. I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then we wondered why we couldn't get our editing, you know, in a space that we liked it. So much brick. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think that, I think that curating does come really naturally to me. It is one thing in our business that I will never outsource. I, Mm -hmm. the Lauren Fair page is me and it will always be me. And it's just something that I feel very strongly that it should continue to be from my voice. Um, other things I will outsource, but I think Instagram curation is huge. So many brides and planners, not just brides, but planners, are mm-hmm. reaching out on Instagram now too, which is yep. really interesting because I think a lot of the high-end planners used to only reach out via email, which they still do, but they're watching you on social media yeah. more than they're watching your blog posts, more than they're watching your website or anything like that. So, um, you know, Instagram curation is huge. If you guys are listening to this, take Darcy up on her curations whenever you do them on Instagram. They're so mm-hmm. good. You should absolutely take Darcy up on that. When I do the website reviews and I get really ruthless and I'm like, no, no, why would you do this? Stop. (laughs) So I did make someone cry at a workshop. So (laughs) we've all been there, (laughs) but I was, I was very nice. It was just that they needed to hear it. They didn't want to hear it, but then they changed their entire business around when they got home Mm. and their business has transformed and she's coming to another one of my workshops this year which is really fun. It's the best. Um, and it's just sometimes we need to get out of ourselves and just hear the truth and then grow from it and learn from it and not take it personally and just be willing to say, okay, aesthetically, let's take emotion out of it. What are my strongest images? And if you're not good at it, hire someone who is good at it exactly. to do it for you. Mm-hmm. If that is not a strength of yours, if you're like look, sitting there looking at your feed on Planoly and saying, I don't know, it just doesn't look like how I want it to look, hire somebody, hire someone who is great at it and they will help you so much because you can train your eye to see a flow and to see, you know, the words. And that's why I love having those three words. And if you are listening to this, I would highly encourage you to sit down. You know, if, if generic words are the first things that come to your mind, go on synonyms.com. Yeah. <laughs> put those words in. And I find use it all stronger. the time. Yep. 
yeah, yeah, find something stronger that you can really, really define your business. And, you know, back to your question of where, when you said, you know, if people want to come to a workshop and they say, how do I do a business like yours? Um, I think the short answer is to not have a business like mine. I think the answer is to create a business that's so strong in your own voice using some of our techniques. But, you know, if we're all sitting here copying the top film photographers, then it's just going to be kind of a regurgitated Fuji 400 world out there yeah, that doesn't so have a voice. And so you have to define what you really resonate with and not what you think you should resonate with, but what you truly love, what you come alive when you shoot and shoot more of that. And it truly does come back down to self-knowledge. You know, I have a friend and he designs a lot of top, like a lot of wedding photography websites. And he told me the other day, he was like, yours is one of the first ones that everybody says, can you make mine look like Darcy's? Yeah. And I was like, kind of flattered, but then I just thought, no, (laughs) like, why why can't people, you know, so I'm redoing my whole one. I'm like, great. That's why I redo it every year. I'm going to be very (laughs) different because I have to keep changing it up. So I do stand out with my voice, with what I care about. And every year you shoot, you get to know yourself better. You get to, those three words start to come easier. You mm-hmm. get, you know, that's why shooting so much is important. I still think going to workshops is important yeah. um, as long as you can get in what you want and exactly. and it's the, it, it's an alignment with you. I think stretching yourself, once I went to this Hollywood lighting, um, really cheap class out in LA from this great old old, old school guy who shot in magazines all over the world. Nobody would know him now because he never did Instagram or whatever. And it put me so far outside of my comfort zone and it truly made me hone in on what I care about when I'm photographing a person and how I can bring more creativity. I think, I think people need to push themselves. We need to be in that space of growth. You need to get to know yourself better. Mm -hmm. Those, then the branding comes so much easier. It does. And one thing I always, you know, recommend to photographers is don't invest $10,000 into a full branding suite your very first year of business because it's kind of a waste of money because you don't know yourself yet. And this branding specialist, you know, no matter how good they are, they're going to come to you and say, who are you? Show me your iconic images. Show me the type of things you want to shoot because I'm going to design based off that. And if you don't know that yet, if you haven't put the, the work in to really figure that out, um, you know, it won't be as worthwhile of an investment. I think I was in business six years before I invested in really solid branding. I just kind of did it myself. I yeah. did order, but every year I was like, I'm getting new business cards. Yeah. And then I'd look at them a year later. I'd be like, what was I thinking? Like my first business card, yeah. they looked like little Polaroids. They had like this horrible yeah. jagged edge. I had this vintage <laughs> bride with this big headpiece on. I'm like, oh. Like a birdcage no. veil. It was a, almost, I shot many of those back in yep. the day. It was like yep. a glam. It was like a, I think it was like a great Gatsby. She had pin curls. It was just oh, yeah. vintage mm-hmm. kitschy, like just so not yeah. what I do now. Yes. <laughs> and um, I was like, I bought 2000 of these cards. What was I thinking? Or something. I don't know, 400. I brought a lot. I, I still have extra. I'm like, what do I do with these? I'm just going to throw yeah. them away. <laughs> they were popular for like two months and then, but I agree with you. The progression of logos is interesting to look back at your own business and be like, wow, I really thought that was like a good logo back then. I was too cheap to buy the font of the logo that I wanted. So they let you type in a practice. Yeah. I typed in my name. I screenshot it and use that as my logo. I didn't even actually buy the font. I'm kind of embarrassed about that. That's when everybody was doing calligraphy. Yep. And so it was this calligraphy, Darcy Benincos, and then I Photoshopped the word photography (laughs) under this screenshot. It took me two hours and I never spent a dime on on it. Amazing. um, And you could only have a white background on your website then. Yeah. It wasn't PNG. Just stick that JPEG right on there. Yeah. The the good news is about everything that's (laughs) developing is we have so much more, I guess, easier access to reflect who we are. And it's easier to get those photos and those video and the different color background and different kind of buttons and different calls to action. It's just easier to develop all of that, um, which I find very fun because you had to go to a professional to get your website Mm -hmm. done. Now I only trust mine done in-house. So only people on my team work on my website. I don't yeah. outsource hardly any of it anymore. Yeah. And uh, it's really nice because I've heard stories of like websites held hostage or people don't know how to log into it or they don't know how to update their blog. Right. Or yeah. Things like yeah. That. We show it, which is 
amazing. Yeah, I do too. Yeah, yeah, show it is the best. I mean, and we have a wonderful designer who's done all our branding for many years. Um, but then I'll just pop in and update all the time. So it's it's amazing. I would definitely recommend just buying like a hundred dollar template mm-hmm. and going with show it if you, you are getting started. So much of it. Yeah. And then invest in the full branding once you know who you are a little bit exactly. more. Exactly. And you know, I think that it's easier now than it was when you and I were starting to be able to define yourself and your brand and your images because there's so much more education. I there mean, is. there was nothing when I there was, was getting started. I took John Canlis's workshop and that was the only one I knew about. I didn't yeah. even know workshops were a thing. Same. And I learned so much at his, it like blew my mind. And the next yeah. year I was like, I'm going to more and more and more. And I hired yes. mentors and yep. yeah, it, it now it's like everyone you love will teach you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I exactly. Yes. And I, and one thing that I am excited about, and I mentioned this to Darcy when we were not recording here, but I mentioned to her that I'm cutting back on weddings to a more reasonable number. You know, our team did 90 weddings in 2019, including my associate photography team. So I shot 40 and they shot 50. I don't know how you did that. I am, I, my jaw, jaw. It's like, been nine years of I that. Even. Mm-hmm. <laughs> one year I shot 65 weddings. The two, Tim and I shot 65 weddings. I, and that was I before am, we had editing really. Have I even up. shot 65 weddings my entire career? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's I have. Crazy. But. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. I do not recommend it. Um, but you do reach a breaking point where you're like, okay, this is not what I want to do forever at this, at this level. And so you've cut yours down to half almost, yeah, right? Yeah, to half. Exactly. So we're taking 20. 20 weddings for 2020, which we're already fully booked at, and we're starting to book 2021. So um, it's just, it's the progression of, and the flow of your business will change year to year. And I think that's okay. And I think that's something that we should embrace and be willing to change. You know, I don't know about you, but for me this year, I really, for the first time in my life, struggled with anxiety. Mm. And I think that full workload of almost 10 years at that pace, at that rate of shooting that much all the time really caught up with me. And how did it present? Were you just anxious to shoot a wedding or did it present in daily life? You were just yeah. overwhelmed or both. Yeah. I was having panic attacks. I was, ha- and that is not me. I mean, yeah. I, I've just never been a person who struggled with anxiety, which is ironic considering our life has been insanely fast paced for 10 years. I mean, mm-hmm. at that volume that we're shooting, that's a lot of pressure yeah. and it never really got to me until this year. Um, And I don't know why. I don't know if it's I turned 30. Maybe I just was like reevaluating the pace. Um, You know, I I thought that I could go at that pace forever. And Mm. I think you just reach a point where you realize you you do have limits and it's okay to have limits and you should have limits. And yeah, I mean, it was just a lot of anxiety presented. And I realized that we had to make some really significant changes. And I already feel 1 million percent better. Uh. And I think just... Sometimes you need a little wake up call yeah. in order to make the shifts for your your mental health and the space that you need to create in your life, not just your business. Because I am not a business, and you are not a business. I I'm a person who owns a business, which is it's, a very hard distinction for an Enneagram three. <laughs> <laughs> and it's hard in America because we prize work so much. We do. Um, Mine didn't present mental health, but it present physically. I gained a ton of weight because yeah. I was always eating on the go. I wasn't mm-hmm. choosing good foods. Um, my thyroid was shot and I didn't realize it. So I was gaining more weight. I started losing my hair. I've lost like two thirds of my hair. That's why it's cut short now because I used yeah. to wear it really long. Yeah. All these things that now I have stepped back. I only do 10 weddings a year. Mm-hmm. I am. I increased my team. I yeah. take time to feed myself well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I have to, it's, and it's a slow process to undo the damage that I did by being such a workaholic. And I wish more people, you know, talked about this stuff because it's, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing to be like, I can't lose weight. And I, and I, every, even if I sleep, I'm exhausted as soon as I wake up and all those things that have to do with our home hormones and things like that. But it came from working all the time, being on an yes. airplane all the time, being in France and being like, I want to eat bread and cheese and then bre- eating bread and cheese everywhere. Cause that's all there exactly. is in Europe is gluten, you know, yeah, of course. And, um, yeah. 
So yeah, I, I hear you on the stepping mm-hmm. back. We have so much talent to give. We, you know, you're, you're just 30 years old, you baby, mm-hmm. you're just yeah. at the cusp, but like the next phase of what you get to put out into the world and what you get to offer. And you've already created such a legacy for you and for others. Thank you. It's really awesome to know that, you know, my whole life, I probably won't be a wedding photographer mm-hmm. transition. I, I, I didn't start wedding photography until I was like 32. So yeah, it was a much later start for me, but yeah, it's really, yeah, I, I know. And I, I think that so many people can resonate with that feeling of being overworked, of your health declining mm-hmm. or any of those things, but it's, I think it's important to talk about and to, to bring light to the conversation and just say, it's okay to create boundaries and, you know, your worth isn't defined by your work. Yeah. Which is yeah. really, really hard to wrap our minds it's hard around. for artists especially because we're so mm-hmm. tied to our work. I was talking to you before we were recording, just I've created empty space and I'm not yeah. allowed to fill it. Where, you know, when you take time off, sometimes you just, then you take on more family obligations or you decide yeah. to volunteer <laughs> or you do all these things. I'm like, I am not allowed to fill this time. Yes. And it feels very, I'm getting better at it, mm-hmm. but it feels weird to not have a day where I'm not like back to back to back to back. I still have a lot of those days, but I make sure at least two days out of my week are very chill. I take off weekends. I don't respond to my clients until Monday. That might yep. that might sound bad to people, but I don't need all the inquiries. So if somebody can't wait till Monday to get a, a quote back for me, I don't recommend it at the beginning, but now yeah. where I'm at, I'm just like, I don't, I don't want to always be on. <laughs> I want Absol- to no, absolutely. Turn and off and healthy. Walk this new dog and take. Remember to take my vitamins and have time exactly. to make an actual dinner that's healthy. Yeah, hundred percent. And I, for me, it's you know making sure that I have time for the gym and working out, yep. and that's a huge part of my health. So I uh, suffer from hemiplegic migraines. Mm. which are basically like a stroke every time you have them. Oh, and so for gosh. me, if I don't limit computer time, if I don't work out, if I don't eat healthy, yeah. it's super, super important for me to do those it like things. It lays you out. Directly, yeah, directly impact. I can't see, I can't talk. Um, and so I've had to learn my limits. And I think a lot of people don't know that about me because – I, I do present as a very happy person. We all do. All it's just what I the world am. is. And yes, everything and on I Instagram presents that. perfect. Yeah. So it's hard of to... And I'm okay with that, by the way. I'm, I'm okay with not having a brand that is more like a lifestyle influencer who like talks yeah. about things like that all the time. I have made a very conscious decision to have my brand be my brand on Instagram. I like it. Um, so I don't... I refuse to feel guilty about that. And I think that whatever you define your brand as, don't feel guilty about not doing the things you could do. You know what I mean? So I think true. If you have, you know, even a couple hundred followers on Instagram, you have an audience and, um, you know, people who look up to you. And I very much am cognizant of the fact that there are people who follow me on Instagram. Yeah. And I don't feel like I need to share about all of that in that space. And I don't feel bad about that. And I, you know, it's just something that I feel like is more like a conversational thing that we can talk about and open up, but I don't see the need to be um, like an Instagram warrior for that at this point. And maybe that'll change someday. Who knows? I just love that you have your boundaries. You know, there are things you can talk about or not talk about. I have my words, like I've told my team, listen, these are the brand values. This Mm -hmm. is what posts will be about. They're not going to be about this or this or this. Exactly. I'm, you know, yeah, it's, it's, everybody gets to do what feels right to them, what their calling is. Mm -hmm. Um, And if they don't, you know, if they don't resonate, like there are some people out there right now, I had a friend who said the major things that are selling on Instagram are like celebrities, Mm -hmm. uh, nudity, and over the top personalities, like people who are just like reality TV type over the top, making huge, big statements. You know, there's this one artist and she just, every painting is, she's flipping the world off and (laughs) F you and blah, blah, blah. And she has a million followers. And I just decided, I'm like, I don't want to be any of those things. I don't want to be a celebrity. I don't Mm want to be over the top personality. I don't, I'm obviously not going to post nudity. You know, that's not, I'm a 42 year old woman. That's not happening. That shit has sold. (laughs) I'll Photoshop, you know, I show the rock. That's true. I'll just keep showing the rock's abs. Of course. Exactly. Yeah. It's not Photoshopped at all. (laughs) In photos with you, right? You're always actually with him. Always, always. (laughs) Um, But 
I think that there's something about allowing yourself to be who you are. Mm -hmm. And if the masses of the world don't resonate with it, all you need is a thousand engaged people and you can make a six figure business. That's what I've always heard. So it doesn't matter. Most people who have over a hundred thousand anyway, have most of them have bought their followers. I've never bought a single one. Same, never. And I'm very proud of that. (laughs) It's just like, let it be, you know, be who you are, put your work out there, hustle. Don't yeah. hustle to the point of extreme. Yeah. Um, I and love don't it. put We're pressure so on wise. yourself. I know. We're so wise, right? You need to be doing a daily radio show. We this have is a podcast. Great. <laughs> <laughs> we should have a podcast. Um, but it is interesting okay. the things you learn from 20 to 30, and then I'm sure again to 40, you're so much wiser than I am. So I'm looking forward to my 30s. I was very much not looking forward to turning 30. And now that I am 30, I feel oh, 30's wonderful. Thirty is when my life began to be yeah, with you. I feel like wonderful. I everything at thirty, and yeah. I feel the same way about forty now. I'm like, Absolutely. oh my gosh, forty used to be so old. I remember seeing pictures of my grandmother, and they didn't dye hair back then, so she just looked old at forty. She had like short cut, yeah. curler set, gray hair. Yeah. Um, I don't. I think I still look twenty seven. So I don't know. It's just I was literally for, just about I mean, to say you look twenty seven to me. Oh, and thank then you. you. Said that. That's crazy. That's because I really meditate good. every day that I look twenty seven. It's mm. my age that I've chosen, and I do believe our brains actually yep. have more control. And I wear sunscreen, but yep. I do think your mindset about your age makes a big difference. If you think forty is old, it's going to be old. I think it's super young. So yeah, exactly. And that's how I feel about thirty. I just feel like it is. The the 30s are just going to be the years in which I, I've always known who I am, but this is this is the decade in which you can take it or leave it if you don't like who I am. Bam! It's a great it's Beyonce feeling. decade. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and that goes for business too. You know, like I want to I want to pour my all into my clients, the ones I choose and the ones I work with, and just have that smaller number and just just kind of hone in, you know, on on things that really matter. Yeah. I've given up this idea that I want this massive following. Mm -hmm. I'm engaging with people who are so connected. I'm making such beautiful friends. I'm educating where I want. It's it's good. You know, sometimes you don't have to grow. You get to live in the space and appreciate what the day-to-day life looks like. Your house is paid for. You Mm -hmm. you can afford good food. Mm -hmm. Like just the simple things. There is that human desire to be bigger, bigger, more, more, more. Have a, it's like that animal part of our brain that just, yeah. I see it with just having a pet now. He's just like, more, more. I, yeah. ah, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the, yeah. this is like the genetic part of us. And right. now but we have- a, And the American part of us. Yeah. The generic, yeah. The genetic American part that just really yeah. needs that um, more, more, more mentality. Mm-hmm. I think that's why you and I probably love to head to Italy and Paris because- yeah, it's slower like, pace. And enjoy, sit and enjoy a dinner. Yes. Yeah. And the dinners are like five hours long and no one's rushing off or checking their phones. You know, it's, it's more about community. And I think you're so right. That's why we, both of us, you know, connect so well with those European cultures and why we spend so much time there. Yeah. Um, someday, by the time I'm 40, I'll, I'll own something in Paris. I believe you. New life goal. It's going to happen for me in the next two years. I'm working. Amazing. Perfect. I'll come stay at your flat until there you I get go. my own. <laughs> I, you're welcome. We'll do more podcasts. Perfect. It has been such a joy to have you on. You're so educated. You're so well-spoken. You're so mm-hmm. open and giving. Thank you for that. Like, I feel like you've truly are in a centered space where you don't get offended. You don't have scarcity. You're not in competition. You're just truly where you are. You've worked hard at that. You guys have honed in your craft. And that's truly what it comes down to. Hard work, Mm -hmm. talent, consistency, joy-filled, bringing your clients the best Mm -hmm. experience that you can, and the work will come. Absolutely. Oh, well, thank you so much. That's so kind. And thank you so much for having me on. This was a wonderful conversation. It was thank awesome. You. We I deviated very us. far from what I think we were going to talk about, but it I liked totally it more. Did. <laughs> yeah. So I hope and that's why I love that you enjoyed just, this. <laughs> yeah. I love what just unfolds and you're so articulate. So I feel like people are going to get a lot of value out of this. So thanks oh. for being on the Play It Brave podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Such an honor. Thank you. You've been listening to the Play It Brave podcast. Love what you heard? Wonderful. You can shout about it in the reviews. I bet you know someone who needs a shot of self-belief. Then don't keep us a secret. 
If you've missed something crucial, we've got show notes for this and all past episodes over at darcybenincosa.com forward slash play it brave. Thanks for tuning in. But don't forget, the world teaches you to play it safe. Stand up, stand out and start playing it brave. 